Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video, I will show you how to name cyclo and bicyclo alkanes. Cyclic alkanes, commonly referred to as rings, occur when you have a carbon chain where the first and last carbon are fused to each other. For example, if I have a straight chain hexane, but I choose to rotate the molecule so that the first carbon sits next to the last carbon, I can simply connect the first and last carbon so that I have a ring made out of carbons and hydrogens. The formula for a cyclic alkane is the same as that for an unsaturated hydrocarbon or an alkene. Recall that the formula for a saturated hydrocarbon is CnH2n plus 2. In the introductory video, we explained that the formula comes from the fact that if we have n number of carbons and every carbon has one hydrogen attached above and one hydrogen below, this gives me double the amount of hydrogens for every carbon, or 2n, and two more hydrogens for the terminal carbons to complete their octet, which gives me the plus 2. We also said that to make an alkene, we have to remove two hydrogens to ensure that carbons still have only four bonds. Adjusting this formula, we can add minus 2, which cancels out the plus 2, giving me CnH2n for an alkene. The same thing occurs for a cyclic alkane. If I look at my hexane, drawn in this manner instead of linear, I can add two hydrogens to every carbon for the 2n portion, followed by an additional hydrogen on each terminal carbon to complete their octets. Just like with a pi bond, if I add an extra bond to fuse the first and last carbon in the ring, I have to remove two hydrogens to ensure that the carbon still has a complete octet, once again giving me the formula of CnH2n for a cyclic alkane. When it comes to naming cyclic alkanes, you approach it the same way that you would for straight chain alkanes. Given that all I have is one cyclic compound, this is my parent chain. And because I have no substituents, I can start counting from any carbon and go around the ring clockwise or counterclockwise. Using the rules introduced in the first video, six carbons gives me a first name of hex, but because these six carbons are in a ring, I have to add the prefix cyclo. Since I only have single bonds, the last name is ane, giving me a final name of cyclohexane. Let's try another problem. For this molecule, I have five carbons in a ring, giving me a first name of pent, a prefix of cyclo, and a last name of ane for the single bonds, giving this molecule the name cyclopentane. When you have simple substituents coming off the ring, the ring is still considered to be your parent chain, but this time you have to start numbering to give your substituents the lowest set of numbers. Given that I only have one substituent, I can choose to go clockwise or counterclockwise for a total carbons of four with the first name of butte. Since this is a ring, I add the prefix cyclo. Only single bonds gives me a last name of ane. The one carbon substituent on carbon one gives me one methyl. However, given that methyl is the only substituent and is therefore understood to be on carbon number one, we don't have to include the number when putting together the final name. Discounting the one, we get a final name of methylcyclobutane. Let's try a multi-substituted problem. Once again, the ring is going to be my parent chain, but now I have to be careful how I number. With two substituents on the top right carbon and one substituent on the lower carbon, the top right is going to be number one. I have the option of numbering counterclockwise, hitting my second substituent at 5, or clockwise hitting the second substituent at 3. The rule is that you have to number your ring so that the substituents get the lowest set of total numbers. Since 3 is lower than 5, I have to number this ring clockwise. Six carbons in the ring gives me a first name of hex. The ring gives me a prefix of cyclo, and only single bonds gives me a last name of ink. I have a two carbon substituent on carbon one, giving me a one ethyl, and I have two one carbon substituents on both one and three, giving me one comma three dimethyl. 
Since I have multiple substituents, the primary position is not self-understood, and so I have to include the numbers before each substituent. Putting these in alphabetical order, I compare E to M. Remember, di just represents two methyls, but is not taken into account when checking for alphabetical order. Since E comes before M, I get a final name of 1-ethyl-1,3-dimethylcyclohexane. When you see a molecule that appears to have two fused rings, this is a bicycloalkane and has an interesting set of rules for naming. You treat this as if it's one large compound rather than naming the two rings individually with a few minor differences. First, let's throw in some vocabulary. The carbons that are attached to both of the rings are called the bridgehead carbons, and a carbon that appears to be part of both rings but is not the attachment is considered the bridge carbon. The parent chain in this case is actually the entire bicyclic ring compound. This includes the carbons on both rings, the bridgehead, and the bridge carbon. You start numbering from one of the bridgehead carbons, and then work your way around the largest ring first, then the smaller ring. In this case, I chose to start at the top, which means I work my way around the left ring, count the bridgehead, and then work my way around the right ring, and finally, the bridge carbon itself also gets a number. Since I have a total of 10 carbons, I still get a first name of Det. Since I only have single bonds, I still get a last name of Ain. Instead of adding the prefix cyclo for a ring, we add the prefix bicyclo for two rings, and this is where it gets exciting. After the prefix bicyclo, you open a set of brackets and include numbers to represent exactly how many carbons are on each side of the ring. You start with the largest ring and look for any carbons that are only part of that ring. That includes carbon number 2, 3, 4, and 5. Since I have four carbons exclusive to the larger ring, I write four dot and then look to the right where I have three carbons, seven, eight, and nine exclusive to the right ring, which gives me a three. I have a single carbon exclusive to the bridge, giving me a one. Putting this name together, I get bicyclo, open brackets, 4.3.1, close brackets, decane. At first this looks scary, but recognize that we still have just the first name, just the last name. We have a prefix that tells us there are two rings, and the number designators tell me exactly how the rings are broken up. To see if you understand, let's try a problem backwards. In this case, we're given bicyclo 221 heptane and asked to draw the molecule. Instead of starting with a parent chain of hept, we'll start with the numbers in the brackets. If we have a bicyclo, we're assuming we have two carbons that are fused, so I like to start with my bridgehead carbons, and then I'll have one ring coming off to the right and one ring coming off to the left. Since I have two for the first one, I'll draw two carbons on the right. Two for the second one gives me two carbons on the left. One for the bridge gives me a carbon in the center. And now I simply connect them as I see them. Since this is a little messy, I prefer to redraw this molecule. And here we have it, bicyclo 221 heptane. Let's try one more problem, this time with substituents. First thing we do is identify the parent chain, which is our bicycloalkane. We start numbering at the parent chain, then work our way clockwise towards the higher priority substituent, coming all the way back to that bridgehead carbon. Ten carbons gives me a first name of Dec, only single bonds gives me a last name of Ain. Since I have two rings, I add the prefix bicyclo, and then open brackets to show what's in each ring. The ring on the right has four exclusive carbons. The ring on the left also has four exclusive carbons. And since there are no carbons on the bridge, we'll put a zero to show that it exists but has no carbons. And last, we'll tackle the substituents. On carbon three, we have an isopropyl group giving me three isopropyl. On carbon nine, we have a methyl giving me nine methyl. Putting them in alphabetical order, we look at the M compared to the I. Isopropyl is one of those exceptions where we don't look at the P, we actually look at the I. 
Since I comes before M, we get a final name of 3-isopropyl-9-methyl-bicyclo-440-decane. In upcoming videos, we'll tackle naming for unsaturated hydrocarbons, including alkenes and alkynes. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, download my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry, using the link below, or visit layofersci.com slash orgo secrets. That's O-R-G-O secrets. For information regarding online tutoring, visit layofersci.com slash orgo tutor. That's O-R-G-O tutor. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and even share it with a friend or two. If you have any questions regarding this video, leave a comment below or contact me through my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Leofersai. There will be many related videos posted over the course of the semester, so go ahead and click the subscribe button to ensure that you don't miss out.